Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar on strengthening the uh, European vaccine uh, ecosystem. Um, does, your, uh, does our vaccine uh, ecosystem uh, in Europe need support to fully embrace the benefits of the digital transformation? If so, uh, what are the barriers to overcome and how to overcome them? These are the sort of questions uh, that uh, we are seeking the answers to today with our um, multi-stakeholder panel. And uh, this event will also be uh, the uh, celebration of the launch uh, of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the white paper on the digital transformation of the European vaccine ecosystem. Uh, prepared by the European Health Management uh, Association. This webinar has been organized by the European Health Management Association, uh, EMA, and has been sponsored by MSD. Uh, the European Health Management uh, Association is a member uh, association based in Brussels, whose uh, mission is excellent health management for a healthy Europe. And we often organize um, such kind of uh, webinars to exchange uh, knowledge and uh, empower uh, health management. My name is Annette Rosanov, and uh, I'm the uh, Policy and Program Director at, uh, at EMA. I will be the moderator uh, for today. So just to uh, talk uh, a little bit about the, um, the background or why this topic, why now, uh, it is because we have the proposal on the European uh, Health Data Space, EHDS, which is progressing in uh, the legislative uh, pipeline and uh, will be hopefully uh, adopted by the end of the year by the European uh, Member States. And uh, this is on the one hand. On the other hand, we have uh, and we are increasingly uh, deploying digital tools, uh, platforms, services, for instance, also under the My Health at Data, uh, My Health at EU uh, brand. Uh, and with that, we realize that it is all, uh, essential to have also our vaccine and vaccination data to be equally included in that uh, data ecosystem or those data sets that we collect, uh, we investigate, and also that we move along with us uh, when we, uh, within a country or when we move uh, across countries uh, within the EU for pleasure or for, for, uh, for work. Um, we saw uh, the success and the, slash also the controversy of the uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccination and, and the digital um, uh, COVID-19 certificate. Uh, that was one example uh, of, of digitalization or digitizing uh, vaccination data. Uh, but the routine vaccination programs have been and will remain uh, a cornerstone of uh, immunization strategies. So uh, that is the, the um, uh, sort of overall comprehensive digital transformation that we would like to see in, uh, in routine vaccination programs. And what we would like to, to understand uh, today is what the role the diff of the different stakeholders uh, is uh, one by one in this ecosystem and also collectively to support, shape and drive the digital transformation of vaccination. And that will be for the, the benefit, the collective benefit of all uh, European societies. So this is the common goal. But let's look at the agenda for today. 
So we will, uh, we have this uh, short introduction, opening remarks, then we will hear about the uh, uh, Emma's white paper, as I said. Uh, we will also open then the floor to a, a panel where we will hear different stakeholders, as, as we said, Digital Health Society about uh, their digital data roundtables, then uh, developing the European health data space, uh, and then the industry perspective on vaccines, and uh, finally the um, uh, 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 civil society and citizens uh, perspective. And then we will open the discussion for um, uh, open the door for uh, the uh, for discussion. So let's look at the uh, speakers uh, for today. Uh, Vladim Reis uh, on behalf of the Digital Health Society, Sibylia. Uh, Kulici on vaccines from Vaccines Europe, uh, Daphne Holt uh, from the Coalition of uh, Life Course Immunization, uh, and uh, um, uh, Tomislav Sokol from the European Parliament. And we will start with uh, uh, Zach Dexon uh, on the Emma's uh, paper. Before we start uh, the uh, speeches, some um, um, housekeeping roles. Uh, we, uh, it's a webinar, so you are muted uh, uh, during the whole um, uh, duration of the speeches, of the presentations. Uh, however, you can use uh, the question and answer um, uh, box uh, to place your questions at any time. Uh, and we will be pleased to take your questions uh, when we open the floor for questions and answers. We will also live tweet. Uh, during the uh, event, so uh, please use uh, the Emma Info uh, hashtag and uh, please follow us uh, on social media. So with this, uh, let's start uh, the first presentation and let's hear about um, uh, Emma's white uh, paper. Uh, Zach uh, will guide us through uh, this white paper. Zach is a policy uh, uh, manager at EMA. Uh, he specialized in health system uh, policies, and he's been working on um, several projects and publications related to vaccination in Europe. So Zach, uh, can you please uh, summarize uh, approximately in 10 minutes what you have found out uh, uh, during your research and what the recommendations from EMA are. Thank you, Zach. Yeah, certainly. And thank you, Annette. Uh, thank you to the audience and my fellow panelists for being here. I have the privilege today of launching the latest EMMA white paper, uh, Strengthening the European Vaccine Ecosystem and Managing the Digital Transition. Uh, so this paper was developed by EMMA, but uh, it was also supported by MSD. And uh, before we get started, I, I think what's important is to really establish what is the digital transition and what is the European vac vaccine ecosystem? What do I mean when I say that? So essentially, we've based our idea of the vaccine ecosystem on the model developed by the Economist Group's Vaccine Ecosystem Initiative, and that's based on five pillars. Uh, so essentially, each of these five pillars that you see in the graphic uh, are affected by digital transformation and have the possibility of harnessing the power of new digital technology. Um, so, for example, research and development, uh, there's new advances in machine learning, AI, centralized databases, but uh, manufacturing has new digital manufacturing techniques uh, to improve, improve flexibility and scaling up of production. Uh, in the procurement and pricing um, area, we have new digital platforms that can have automated evaluation and submission of bids to improve transparency. Um, we can also work through the supply chain management with digital logistics systems uh, and obviously of uh, great importance is user uptake and acceptance. So things like health apps that can help remind people, um, you know, when they need to book their vaccination appointments, when they're due for a booster and, and things like that. So that's kind of the context that we're working in, uh, because the purpose of this white paper is to really give the health managers perspective on this vaccine ecosystem and how we can best manage this digital transition to really maximize benefits for everyone involved uh, from patients to civil society, to industry, um, to, to the governments and the, obviously the health managers that will be working directly with the new systems and the new data that we come up with. So uh, with this paper, we've developed seven policy recommendations uh, designed to support a strong and sustainable vaccine ecosystem in Europe. 
And these are directed directly at policymakers, both at the EU and national level, but also at health managers who will be implementing these, these policies and who will be working directly with the digital new de digital technologies. And the perspective of health managers, managers does matter in this topic, of course. They work across government, industry, academic, civil society, and care settings, and often they're on the front lines of implementing these challenges. So we feel that it's really important that their voice is heard in, in this discussion. Um, so things like uh, health managers are responsible for um, creating new evidence-based vaccine programming, and they need good data to do that. They play a critical role in protecting health data for citizens by ensuring that their systems have good security. And uh, they're also responsible for providing the health workforce with the skills they need to adapt. Um, so just a bit about how we've come up with our recommendations. Uh, we started with a broad literature view of the, to just ma basically map the landscape um, of digital transition and the vaccine ecosystem. And then we convened an expert focus group and had a little workshop. Uh, basically, these experts came from different areas of practice, and we ensured that our recommendations really were fit for purpose. But we wanted to take that a step further, and uh, we actually reached out to then a broader vaccination expert community across Europe uh, with, through a survey and also through some really more intensive stakeholder consultation interviews so that we could really refine our recommendations, make sure that they really reflect the needs of health managers in different contexts across Europe. And that led to our final recommendations. So just a bit about what we've learned. And I encourage you to read the full paper to really get a sense of everything that we've, we've been working on and, and coming across. But essentially, some of the key highlights uh, from, from our work, from our findings, uh, we have responses to the survey and consultations covering practice in 27 different European countries. So we really have a good breadth of information and data coming from across Europe. And some of the most widely supported recommendations were those related to the inclusion of vaccine specific considerations in the development of the European health data space. So that means things like rather than having uh, language that's very generic about the sharing of health data, there was a feeling and an understanding among health managers that vaccine specific data and the needs for the need for data that really works with vaccination programs and practices. Uh, needs to be really specifically addressed. And, and one way that, that they agreed that that could be done is the creation of frameworks and standards for managing digital trans transformation. So let's say we were to develop, to develop the EHDS and the frameworks for data, uh, the individual health managers and member states would really benefit from specific frameworks and standards of how can we implement this data collection process how do we collect the right data? How do we get the support we need? Let's say if we need a bit of uh, extra support for improving our digital capacity or our workforce skills, uh, we would love some standards and frameworks surrounding that. Uh, and basically following from that point is the idea that the platforms that will eventually support the EHDS, the really practical technical platforms, they need to be developed in consultation with health managers in different settings between different countries, but also different regions and care settings. Because from the information we've, we've gathered, there's really a wide variance in the available digital capacity that exists uh, across European states, but also across within regions. So we've had a couple of health managers, for example, uh, gave us the idea that uh, even a pilot test, so once the EHDS platform was ready to be launched, it would actually be really helpful to have this piloted in different regions, in different healthcare settings, because they all have different capacities and they're currently working with different systems. Some of them are working with much older digital systems, some are still on pen and paper. So in order to make sure that this system and this platform and this data really is accessible and effective for everyone, it's important that we have all of their input into how it's developed. Um, there's also the need for digital systems that are adequate for the practical demands of their work. So a lot of things like reaching hard to reach populations with vaccine programming, uh, understanding what best practices are done uh, to reach those populations in other countries. That's the type of data that's really valuable for, for this type of work at the ground level and, and the type of data we really need to include in, in any Europe wide data sharing system. And of course, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the importance of the health workforce, because uh, without proper up and reskilling of the healthcare workforce, uh, they need the digital skills. They need to be able to adapt to modern systems. If we're going to be making changes to the way that, the way that they work, 
we need to support them with, with a, a appropriate training. Um, so with that said, uh, those are some of the highlights from, from our work. Um, and we've come up with seven policy recommendations. So based on practical and scientific evidence that are really going to be grounded uh, in practice. So the first is just to consult with vaccine researchers, health managers, industry leaders, and policymakers. So basically consult the stakeholders uh, about how the European data space gets developed and, and how we can include vaccine specific data and vaccine specific practice. Uh, and another, another really important point while we do that is to commit to making the vaccine data accessible in a way that promotes interoperability so that we can all work better together. Uh, but it's also important to make sure that citizens retain ownership and control of their data at the end of the day. That's, that's going to be a key point, uh, I'm sure raised by other speakers as well, but uh, we'll raise it here too because it does matter. And um, we also want to work towards broader European cooperation on vaccines because as we know, vaccine preventable diseases often don't care about national borders. They, they don't exist strictly inside or outside of the EU. We need to have a a bit more cooperation with some of the other states in Europe, uh, not just the EU. Um, of course, as I mentioned, the support for upskilling and reskilling of the healthcare workforce is an important recommendation for us, um, as is creating a framework for transforming the infrastructure created during COVID-19 into different tools supporting vaccination. So things like the COVID-19 vaccine certificates and, and the different health apps, those we think have a strong value. The infrastructure is there and they can be used to improve vaccine uptake and improve engagement by citizens. Uh, and finally, we did discuss a bit about implementing standards, but uh, this is one of our recommendations to make sure that we have standards for scaling up digital vaccine management so that we can, we're all on the same page, so to speak. So we have the same monitoring, maintenance, supply chains, um, things work just better across borders with, with these standards in place. And um, one final recommendation that came from the research is that we need to really understand and assess how uh, these digital technologies are affecting the, the vaccine ecosystem. And we need further research and further assessment for that. Um, so with that said, uh, I do encourage you to read the full report and you can find it by following the link one of my colleagues has posted in the chat. And uh, I'm not, just thank you for being here and thank you for, for letting me introduce this, this paper to you. Thank you, uh, Zach, for this uh, very comprehensive overview. I know that it's it's not uh, easy to, to summarize in, in, in 10 minutes. Uh, I am uh, suspicious indeed that consultation of stakeholders uh, making uh, data available, broader cooperation, they will come up still uh, uh, by the, the uh, uh, panel speakers uh, later on. Uh, indeed, uh, you can find uh, the full um, reports link in the chat, and uh, we also uh, uh, tweeted it out during uh, Zach's speech. Uh, so uh, please don't hesitate to uh, to uh, disseminate it and uh, and to download. Uh, Zach, I would encourage you not to run away. Stay with us because uh, possibly you want to just react uh, to the panel whom I'm uh, introducing now. The first on our panel will be uh, Vladin uh, and uh, Vladin Rees, uh, who is the deputy chair of the European Connected Health Alliance. EA, uh, ECH uh, Alliance, and uh, he's chairing the Digital Health Society. Digital Health Society has conducted a number of uh, round tables also on, um, on vaccination information systems. And uh, this is what uh, Bladin would like to uh, share uh, the experience about. Uh, Bladin, the floor is yours. So good morning. And uh, uh, it's great to be collaborating with Emma today on this important subject. So I'm going to quickly summarize the results of a multi-stakeholder roundtable organized by the European Institute for Innovation through Health Data and the Digital Health Society. And as you can see on my slide, the report is entitled Immunization Information Systems, Making Interoperable Systems for Vaccination a Reality in Europe. And our work jumps off the back of an open sky report, which carried out a review of all immunization information systems in Europe and the United Kingdom. And I hope that in the chat, you'll find a link to both 
our report and to the Open Sky report. So just setting the scene in terms of the importance and urgency of this topic. So the COVID uh, pandemic has taught us the value of real time interoperable data across Europe and uh, in particular the cooperation that was uh, required for the EU digital COVID certificate. But the Open Sky report has highlighted the variation in maturity of immunization information systems and the correlation between that maturity and vaccination coverage. And we've already mentioned a number of times uh, the European health data space, which is both exciting as it is important, but it provides the catalyst for accelerated cross-border access to citizen level immunization information and aggregated data intelligence on coverage, outbreaks, and the effectiveness of prevention and containment strategies. But there has never been a better time to take advantage of immunization information systems and um, the European uh, data superhighway. But at the same time, there's never been more important time and an urgent need to be prepared for potential new pandemics. So the roundtable process was 20 uh, multi-stakeholders, experts in vaccine development, immunization programs, public health, clinicians, immunization uh, systems, uh, informatics, as well as patient representatives. It was held in June and July last year, and the aim was to formulate actions to advance Europe's immunization intelligence capability and program effectiveness. We had three important um, subjects. One, key use cases for immunization information systems. Two, design considerations for the role of standards and success factors and recommendations and calls to action. And I'll briefly summarize these in the next few slides. So the most important use case was vaccination record access to individuals and families. So we can all find out what vaccines we've had, what boosters are coming uh, in order for us to manage our, our healthcare and to be empowered. Other use cases were uh, continuity of care across borders as we work across borders, tracking complications and adverse events for individuals and populations, uh, fundamental to being able to reassure uh, public about complications and side effects, just think of COVID. And the better data we have, the better able we are to provide this reassurance. Then linking vaccination coverage to disease burden, outbreaks to vaccination coverage gaps, campaigns to vaccination uptake, and then making data available for academic and industry research and allowing them to learn from each other. Then comparisons of vaccination uh, programs and delivery models. This one slide is affect the gold standard, we believe, for intelligence capability and functions of an uh, immunization information system. And I'm not going to go through uh, each of the bullet points, but we'll draw the, uh, the obvious uh, link between uh, the three segments, person specific, population level, and program level. So on person specific, obviously the ability to find out, as I've mentioned, what your vaccination status is. Population level, sort of customer relationship management, being able to schedule uh, uh, vaccination appointments, rem reminding people, targeted education and information to uh, individuals, and then program specific. So vaccination supply chain management uh, factors influencing vaccination hesitancy, as well as education programs. So looking then to over the next few slides, some of our recommendations. Uh, the most important recommendation was that we thought immunization should be a focus for the European Commission's One Health mission, recognizing that it then becomes a, an inherent and important component of European strategy. Um, there are many prerequisites and success factors detailed in our report in order to give effect to this recommendation. Other recommendations are uh, the member states holding the EU presidency should help accelerate European-wide alignment on data sets and data standards, 
including immunization information systems as one of the priorities. Research and consultations with member states is needed to determine what incentives are required to enable countries in the amber and red zones of the open sky heat map to shift towards green. This support could be funding, it could be expertise, or it could be giving access to uh, shared technology. Core data sets need to be defined with multi-stakeholder cross-country involvement, including WHO. Interoperability standards and data quality standards are required for these data sets. And coordination across sectors is required because in some member states, immunization records are part of the education record or occupation records. The European Commission must advance European co coherence on immunization systems and support the early adoption of immunization data space. Indeed, we actually think that for the European health data space, it would be fantastic to see one of the first use cases being the development of an, an immunization data space. Large scale demonstrators should be funded for models and tools that enable individuals to exercise control over their personal vaccination and information systems. And we think that regional health systems have a leading role to play in this development. Turning then to DG Health and DG Connect, we think they should extend multi-stakeholder engagement to foster country alignment. And this multi-stakeholder involvement is the European Commission, WHO, ECDC, for policy, ministries of health and public health agencies, for uh, patients, civil society and healthcare professionals, which are essential in, in order to build and maintain trust that must underpin these systems. Clinical and immunization experts and standard development organizations and semantic experts. So then looking to uh, success factors in conclusion, there are four. So first of all, respecting and maintaining public trust in immunization systems as greater data sharing is enabled is key. And compliance then with GDPR becomes absolutely crucial. And as we know from the pandemic where we saw a location tracking, many citizens had concerns about who was accessing this data and for what purpose. And then also inevitably this trust is also linked to the whole question of trust in the vaccines themselves. Secondly, clearly defining and agreeing across stakeholders the scope and use cases that immunization information systems should support. Three, defining a, a core set of immunization information system functions that allows member states with limited infrastructure and funding to resource most effectively the priorities uh, that they need to uh, select. And then fourthly, agreeing EUI data sharing protocols. And it's key that we all work together, share together and protect, protect each other with uh, early intelligence. In order to do this, we need agreed protocols, data rules and permissions to allow rapid response to any future threats. And I hope with that, I've whetted your appetite to take a more detailed look at our report. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vladin. And uh, indeed in the chat, uh, you can find the link to the full uh, report. Uh, and actually now I would have a question to you, but we are expecting, um, uh, Tomislav Sokol to join us in a minute. Uh, so with while we are uh, waiting, uh, perhaps I will just anticipate the question. Um, uh, we have uh, Tomislav Sokol so, uh, join us. So I will get back to you, Bledin, uh, with the with my with my question. Um, good morning, Mr. Sokol. Oh, pleased to welcome you. Uh, and uh, uh, so Tomislav Sokol uh, is a member of the European Parliament and member of uh, various committees like the IMCO Committee, the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee, is member of the Special Committee on COVID-19 Pandemic, 
uh, and uh, also the Envy Committee, uh, Environment, Public Health and the Food Safety Committee that the, uh, just launched actually now a new subcommittee on public health. And he's rapporteur uh, on uh, uh, the uh, EHDS uh, dossier. So uh, I'm uh, passing the floor on to you, uh, Mr. Sokol. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this important, important event. Uh, and I'm glad that I'll be able to speak, at least I was told to do that, uh, to speak about the EHDS, the European Health Data Space, which I think is the most important piece of legislation that we'll be working on in the in, in this parliamentary term related to health. As you know, the, the proposal was uh, presented by the European Commission in May last year, but it took some time for us to determine which is the responsible committee because the the, in the parliament, because, in the, because the first committee, which, which should have been the lead committee, was, the, was appointed uh, a committee on civil liberties. Uh, so that would mean that, that they would have the priority and that uh, the committee on public health and environment, the the envy, the envy committee should should be kind of uh, in the background. So we we of course didn't want that. We felt we felt that healthcare uh, is the primary purpose. Better healthcare, better health outcomes. That that is the primary purpose of this regulation. So so in the end, the decision was made that we have two joint lead committees. So both both the both the the envy committee and the and the leader committee. Uh, just a second. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, we, so, so this is why it took some time for us to 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 start to start working on the proposal in the parliament. But now we are we are almost uh, finished with the first draft draft report, and and after that we'll see how the political negotiations will go. Of course, the, uh, the 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 main idea of uh, European health data space is to make it possible to use health data much much more easily both for primary use and secondary use primary use of course is used by healthcare professionals and this means that in the context of cross-border healthcare it will be much easier for patients to get uh, healthcare much faster than it was before so for instance if you are staying in a in a member state uh, outside of your state of residence for purposes of studying of work or something else and you need to go to see a doctor then that uh, doctor would be able to to check your health record uh, see see see, uh, so, uh, see your past diagnostics maybe allergies so if you need to uh, to to get some treatment uh, or medicine to see whether you have some past allergies other conditions etc so this will, the the idea is that this will make it much your healthcare much faster in the health of in in the country in which you are staying, so so that they will not have to repeat all the diagnostics and all and and check all the things that have already been been done in your state of residence, and of course also to 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 increase the quality of healthcare. And I think that uh, that the, that this whole concept of primary healthcare is something that everybody will support. There will be some technical uh, disagreements, maybe, but in the but in the end, uh, definitely this will this will be this this is something that everybody will support in the end. Uh, a much more contentious issue is the secondary use of data. Uh, second, secondary use of data means the, the data which is used uh, for purposes of research, of, uh, of innovation, uh, uh, and things like that. Of course, uh, this whole, of course, uh, this whole idea is very important because we know that in many that real world data, which will be gathered through the European Health Data Space, is something which, which is also very important, but not not used to a significant extent. Uh, so, for instance, for making policy decisions, also for for obtaining data which we cannot obtain through clinical trials, for instance, for rare diseases where we just don't have enough uh, patients for uh, to undergo phase three clinical trials. And I think also if we had this kind of a situation, uh, this mu this much easier flow of data between member states, that also maybe some policy decisions during the pandemic could could have been different. Uh, so the idea is to make it possible to use data across uh, across borders within a secured setting, and also. But what is very important is also to create standardized protocols and methodologies how data is used and uh, to make it interoperable. So the data from different member states can be used instead of having all the obstacles that we have today, because we where, where because of lack of interoperability, data from one member state often cannot be used in another member state. Of course, here, the, uh, here, here, it, uh, 
what I would like to emphasize is that this is the, the, the data which will be used for secondary purposes will not be personal data in the sense that that it can be traced directly to individual patients. So it will be anonymized, pseudonymized data. We are working on the concrete wording on that, uh, but definitely aggregated data as well. But the idea is that this is data that cannot be that that this data cannot be used to identify individual patients, of course, who were who were uh, whose who, 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 whose data was was gathered. Uh, of course, of course, there will, be, there will be major issues. There will be major issues, like for instance, the, the issue of the patient's role in, in in the whole in the whole system of secondary use of data. The questions of IP rights, but I be, but I believe that the that a real balance can be struck. And I think the crucial thing will be to how to strike a balance between the necessity to use data in a much more easy in a much more e easier way that, than than uh, than it is possible now but also uh, to protect uh, date, the the personal data privacy of patients etc so we are still working working on what would be the patient's role but what we would like what we would definitely uh, want is to strengthen the role of stakeholders in the governance bodies of the HDS so we'll go in that direction and also also on how to best way how to protect ip rights but also not to the extent that data cannot be used and of course uh, the role of patients I trust that uh, Mr. Sokol will uh, reconnect in a moment. Uh, it is just uh, an internet uh, problem. And in the meantime, uh, let me just uh, then refer back to uh, Bledin with my, my question. Um, uh, uh, Bledin, you mentioned that the European Commission uh, should anchor this uh, immunization uh, uh, information uh, systems into one uh, into one half and uh, how do you see the the coordination uh, different uh, across different sectors uh, that how can could be it improved for the common goal we mentioned uh, improving uh, vaccination uh, programs uh, for all societies. So this will be my question to you uh, after Mr. Sokol's uh, presentation. So I will just let you think that over uh, till Mr. Sokol finishes his, uh, his speech. So the coordination between different stakeholders, sectors um, to improve uh, vaccination. I'm just asking my colleagues if you have the mobile number of Mrs. Sokol's assistant. Ah, we, we have uh, Mr. Sokol with us again. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, we had problem with the, with the internet. So. Internet. Yes. <laughs> so apologies, but 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 I, but I was close to finishing. So what is also what is also important that uh, so, so so I think I, I said uh, I said most of the things about the patient involvement. Also, we will uh, strengthen the involvement of stakeholders. Uh, and what, what is also important, what I would like to emphasize is. That that we will that we'll have very strong controls, which will make sure that there's this, that this, this, this data is only used also for the positive purposes, for public interest, for healthcare. This is something which I think is very important. So, so this whole system does not mean that somebody can come from the street and just take somebody's health data. We will have a secure environment. We will have and this is. I'm afraid that uh, Mrs. Sokol has again lost connection. At least on my screen, he's frozen. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, let's try just uh, if he can still join, because I know that he has also limited uh, time. Uh, availability. So uh, hopefully, for the final words, he can still join uh, join us to continue from the uh, thoughts of um, 
secondary use of data and use of patients. Data. Uh, uh, Zach, I see that you have unmuted yourself. Yeah, perhaps well, perhaps some... while we're perhaps while we're waiting, we might uh, just continue with Blood in uh, in his answer. Oh, and I see uh, that he's back, he's back. again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to keep doing that to okay. you, Blood. Can Can you hear me and see me now again? Yes, yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes, so it seems that the European Parliament should also invest more into digitalization because, <laughs> because this is the Wi-Fi of the, the, the Internet of the Parliament, which is breaking, which is breaking, which is not a good PR for the Parliament's IT service, but that's an infrastructure, but that's a separate issue. So, so to so to to so to wrap up, uh, so the idea is that this data will will only be used for healthcare purposes for pub, for purposes of public interest. Uh, this will be the this will be the main idea. It could it, this data could also be accessed by both private and public bodies, which means university research institutes, etc. So everybody will be able to 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 benefit from this data, and this will be done in a secure environment after an approval from the relevant governance bodies, health data access bodies which will be set up in the member states so so, so these are all the guarantee these are the guarantees and safety mechanisms which will make sure that data is not abused of course what we will do in the parliament we will try we will preserve the main the basic principles of the proposal of the commission but to even strengthen even more this public interest domain of the of the proposal and to really make sure that data is used only for the for the for the purposes of public interest for uh, improving health healthcare protection also what we, what we what we will ask for is a stronger investment so, so in in terms of stronger uh, stronger financing from eu level from centralized level because in the current proposal, the Commission envisages that a big part of the funding will, for, for the infrastructure, for the education of people and training, will go from the national national uh, national budgets, national cohesion policy funds, and also uh, which are spent by the member states, EU cohesion policy funds spent by the member states, and national recovery and resilience plans. And we do not agree with this because because the national recovery and resilience plans were made before. Uh, the EHDS regulation was proposed, which means that member states could not uh, earmark the the necessary funding at that stage for something that at that time was, was not what was not existing. Uh, so that, so definitely for that reason, we will ask for stronger funding from the EU level, from centralized level. We, we believe that a lot of investments should be done into infrastructure, and but also into training of uh, healthcare personnel in the new ways on how to. On, uh, on how to be part of the EHDS. Uh, especially there are big differences in the in member states in terms of digital infrastructure, in, in, uh, both on the general level, also on the regional level, also on the level of individual hospitals. So there are big, di there are big differences. So we, we believe that if we want to have a level playing field that everybody can take part in this, that, we, that EU will really have to, uh, would really have to step up and provide much more additional funding than it is in the proposal. And this is something that the parliament will be fighting for. So to sum up, I think the HDS regulation is one of those rare legislative proposals uh, on the EU level, which really can make a difference, which can really make make it possible to use health data much more than it was before, than, than, it, than it is now, to make uh, health data inter, uh, and national systems interoperable, so data can be exchanged, and this should definitely lead to, to more research, more innovation, uh, more new healthcare technologies, but also better and faster care for healthcare pa for uh, patients in a cross-border setting. And just one last point on the timeline. So, as I start, as I said, we are currently working on the first draft of the proposal of the European Parliament's report. After that, um, we'll wait for the amendments from dif different political groups, and then we will start negotiations, uh, political negotiations, to get the majority in the Parliament on the text uh, sometime uh, mid March. And I'm hope, which for European institutions context is um, very optimistic and very ambitious, but uh, we don't have a choice to finish these political negotiations in the parliament before summer, so that just after summer in September and or October at the latest, we can start negotiations with the member states in the council to have the final text, the final political agreement between the parliament and the commission and the council made by the end of this year. Because if we go, if we go if we uh, go into next year with this uh, file unfinished uh, that is the election year nobody will be actually everybody will be thinking about re-election and about the electoral campaign etc and have, and at that point i believe it will be impossible to finish uh, this file before the end of this parliamentary term 
So that so our goal is to finish everything by the end of 2023. Everybody says that it's ambitious. I know that it is, but I don't. I think we don't have a choice if we want this really to to work and to and to have uh, better health outcomes and better medical care for European citizens. Thank so that, that was all that I wanted to say. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Tomislav. Uh, uh, do you have a, 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 some more minutes for a question, or do you have to leave now? Uh, maybe, maybe just one question. Just one. Wait, just, question just, one just one question. Yeah, uh, indeed, because it's pretty hectic now in the Parliament, so we have a lot of different activities. Uh, and we appreciate your 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 time. Uh, so you mentioned this very ambitious uh, timeline. How do you um, uh, ensure political alignment within this uh, short time frame before the uh, elections uh, and accommodate all stakeholder needs and views? Uh, in EHDS, yes, I mean, so what, one is the one is the alignment of, of different interests of different stakeholders, and the other is of different political groups. Because what is important is that we need to get the majority in the parliament. And I'm sure that on the parliamentary side, on the political side, of course, I, I do not believe that we'll be able to have a complete consensus. But I think that especially the biggest uh, centrist political groups are already pretty close to kind of general principles that they want to that they want to uh, preserve. And I think that that on this we can be very close to agreement. I think one of the the main contentious issues will probably be about the patient's role, the question of consent, etc. But I think that you can really strike a good balance there. On the question of stakeholders, of course, it's impossible to uh, to uh, to uh, let's say appease all the wishes of all stakeholders. That's just impossible because they are, because they are uh, differing and opposing views of different stakeholders. But I think that we really have to try to strike a balance between them to try to have a balanced approach so that everybody's interests are taken ab uh, aboard in a reasonable way uh, but of course it does not that that mean that, that means that you cannot uh, j accept everything that everybody proposes because some things are just uh, op opposite to one another but i think that we can find that we can find a good balance uh, I, uh, but what is what is important is that on one side we really uh, make sure that uh, data the data and privacy of patients is protected and also if they want to not to be part of the systems for second use that they can decide not to but that we should also not not impose too much obstacles we should make in the end the use of data impossible so uh, so definitely so definitely so definitely aligning, aligning different interests also taking into account the gdpr gdpr will all still be applied so this does not mean that uh, that gdpr will stop being applied to health data it will still be applied but we will uh, regulate some things in more detail in a more precise way than it is in the GDPR. Uh, but the crucial thing is that, and I believe that we can strike this balance that on one side, patients' uh, wishes and privacy are protected, but that on the other side, we also make, uh, make it easier to use health data and to exchange data to make it easier than it is now. Thanks very much for this uh, uh, summary uh, of um, uh, aligning interests and uh, thank you for leading on the public interest domain advocation and good luck uh, for, uh, for all your work uh, to finalize this dossier before the election. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Bledin, can we go back to the question uh, I just asked you before uh, Tomislav Sokol's uh, speech on uh, making immunization as an uh, uh, inherent component of, um, of uh, one uh, health mission and the uh, coordination across sectors. So, so I'm sure that um, communication is going to come up from probably all of the panel. And, and part of the answer to the question is, uh, is covered in um, communication, by which I mean both listening to, as well as informing people of um, uh, the, the sort of content that we've been discussing. So in particular, you know, as I mentioned in some of my slides, GG Health and DG Connect need to work together, and they need to be involving multi-stakeholder engagement. Uh, and all of the organizations I'd listed. But in, in the context of asking about sectors where education and uh, the workplace ha uh, may maintain vaccination records, then I think uh, this uh, requirement to really consult and discuss 
uh, with uh, the widest variety of multi-stakeholders is essential if we're going to um, uh, really see cross-sectoral uh, success. Um, but so much of vaccination seems to me to start with children. So certainly a priority uh, uh, in, in some ways is to see uh, the, the systems that operate with children uh, being developed further and jumping and learning from everything that happens uh, with uh, vaccinating uh, uh, our, our young people. Thank you, uh, Bledin. And uh, just um, uh, capitalizing on what you said, uh, listening to uh, uh, different stakeholders and communication, uh, in that spirit, I will move on uh, with uh, listening to uh, other uh, stakeholder voices like the industry. Uh, and I'm introducing uh, Sibylla Quilici, who is the executive director of uh, Vaccines Europe uh, at the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and the Association, FPA. Uh, Sibylla, uh, please share with us the industry's uh, voice. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can see also the slide, not in presentation mode yet, no, not just yet, but it's coming. Indeed, now it's perfect, Billy. Go That's ahead. Good. So thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. And this is really an important topic. Um, so I'll, I'll try to not repeat and, and will not repeat what has been said already because so much uh, from, uh, from everybody has been, uh, been said. Just a, a very quick view on, on, on who we are uh, as Vaccines Europe. So we are a specialized group as part of the European Federation of the Pharmaceutical Industry Association, and we do represent only the vaccine industry. And, and this was done 30 years ago. So it was quite of a forward looking uh, decision at that time. And, and I'm spending a bit of time to, to explain why this was done. We are very specific to FPR uh, because the vaccine industry is very specific. It's very specific because the vaccine itself as a product is very specific. Uh, it's specific because in terms of orange is complex, uh, we, are, we are touching on the immunology here and is, is really, really one of the most complex area for research and development. But once we get to a vaccine, this is also a complex product, a complex product because it's a biological product and, and we, we, we deal here with, uh, with evolving viruses and pathogens and bacteria. And, uh, and, and the mission, the mission in terms of public health mission is absolutely tremendous. I mean, we are not targeting specific individuals per se, but it's really a population, a broad population uh, policy here that uh, public health policies here that we are, we are dealing with. And you are not allowed to, to make mistakes. So, so the vaccines need to be very safe, very safe and efficacious in order to, to bring the, uh, the public health values that, uh, that they are aiming for. And manufacturing a, a vaccine is complex. It takes uh, months, years for the most complex vaccines. If I just take, for example, my influenza uh, from, from the very beginning, when you, you start really getting your, your different materials down to, uh, to, to the distribution, is over a year uh, uh, to get. Uh, uh, MMR vaccines, for example, is, is, is over two years. The most complex vaccines that are conjugate vaccines or multivalent vaccines, such as an HPV vaccine, is, is three years and beyond that. And you will get why I'm saying all of this and why I'm, I'm getting pre uh, precise with is that regards is because when you want to supply in the right quantity for the, for the population, for the member states, uh, the vaccines, you need to really, really anticipate your demand. You need to know exactly uh, how, how much vaccines you need to protect your population while in advance, because when you start actually um, your uh, you submit your request to, to us, to the manufacturers, then the production starts four years before, sometimes for some vaccines, or at least two years before uh, for most vaccines. So COVID-19 vaccines we've seen over the last year coming with a new technology, mRNA, is a different story. And it's going to reshape completely the, the way of things works, but it is not going to replace the other technology neither, because the mRNA will not be adaptable to uh, every vaccines or every pathogens. So this is also very important to consider. So those, these specificities also uh, is translated in the way 
uh, vaccines are used and which is again specific. We are dependent on Im national immunization programs. This is the only product that require a recommendation to be integrated in a national immunization program that is really based on the decisions of the National Public Health Institutes. Uh, so it's not because just you, you, you have an infection, you can get like this, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the vaccines. It's, it's a prevention. It's a prevention. So, so, so you, you need to, to, to base all of this on, on a national recommendation. And, and this made another layer of complexity and, and, and lead, lead to, uh, to the theme of this, uh, of this debate discussion is the vaccine ecosystem. It was well presented by Zachary at the beginning. It's, it's a complex ecosystem with multi-stakeholders and the mission, the public health mission is also very complex. We know about vaccine hesitancy. We know how complex it is to, uh, uh, to have efficient vaccination programs. And we all are responsible. We all have a role to play in this ecosystem to make this successful. So this is, uh, I think, really important to, uh, to understand because we cannot afford having silos, stakeholders not working together because of uh, different uh, divergence positions with regards to public or private, for instance, because all of this collaboration and for the same purpose is to protect the population. So this is our mission. Uh, so I'm just not going to go through, through that too, too much. It's, our mission is really to make sure that we uh, su have a sustainable and resilient vaccine environment uh, in Europe to protect people against infectious diseases, at all stages of life. And here we'll go back to also what Bledin said, mentioning was the need to integrate as part of the pediatric vaccination program. In fact, vaccines goes beyond pediatrics today. It's really a life course program from birth to grave somehow. So we have the, the, the young ones, the adolescents, the adults, and the older adults. And we've seen that COVID-19, for instance, is an adult vaccination from the beginning, targeting the older, the at-risk population uh, and respiratory tract infections um, uh, often target many adult uh, populations. So we need to ensure that the, the old digitalization um, of the system takes into account a life course approach uh, because of the complexity also of the infections and that goes across the lifespan. So with regards to the digital transformation, um, for, I believe that it will be a game changer, a game changer with regards to the complexity we are seeing today with the right implementation, with the implementation of the immunization programs, with the adherence of the population to those immunization programs, with regards to vaccine confidence, but also with regards to um, really unlocking the full benefits that vaccination can provide with regards to uh, supporting healthcare system resiliency as well as the society resiliency. So IIS, Immunization Information System uh, and Digital Vaccination Card, this has been presented uh, broadly by, by, the, by, by the, the different speakers until now, so I'm not going to go, uh, to go back to what has been said, but from for us, as an industry, so, so there is benefit as it is here for the healthcare providers, there is benefit for the um, uh, policymakers in terms of how to implement better their programs because they have the, the right information for the individuals and for the population because they benefit from records mechanism, etc. They are empowered to take to, uh, to with regards to their vaccination status and can be really honored to, uh, to their decision making process with regards to being vaccinated or not. So in that regard, uh, the, the, the tools, the digitalization of the immunization records would actually bring uh, support to, to um, benefits to the different layer um, of the systems. But with regards to the industry, what this means as well to us, it means that um, we, we know where we need to supply if there is something that is missing, if there are vaccines that are missing, if there is a, an issue with regards to the, to the coverage rates, uh, we, we can anticipate uh, what will be the supply needs potentially to, uh, to anticipate uh, uh, an outbreak to anticipate uh, uh, an epidemic. So this is really uh, important for us in order to forecast the quantity of vaccines that will be uh, needed and for the member states and, the, and the, uh, the government to purchase the adequate quantity of vaccines that will be needed. 
So to go back of the complexity of manufacturing in order to, uh, to, to really forecast better. So better supply and demand anticipation would be critical. It's also going to be very, very useful with regards to safety and effectiveness. So safety and effectiveness data uh, are absolutely critical. Uh, critical to ensure uh, that the vaccine that is brought to the population is the right ones. So with, with data, we will know better how the vaccines are performing depending on the specific uh, population. We will know uh, uh, straight away how this is also performing with regards to safety. A lot of studies are uh, actually um, are happening today. This is, uh, this is not the issue, but once you can really rely on, uh, on, on those data in a, in a timely manner uh, and in a real world manner, and uh, this is the best way for us to, uh, to act. So this link to timely monitoring. Timely monitoring, uh, we've seen the, the benefit of this during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the CDC provided a COVID-19 vaccines tracker. You can have access to coverage rates, uh, surveillance uh, of the epidemic, but also coverage rates uh, of the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, in a, it was if we, weekly, uh, and by weekly, if I remember correctly, and then it gives really the, the ability for member states to take the right decision uh, with the right public health tools that they have in hand in order to, pro to protect the population. But for us as well, it, it, it gives a, a tremendous level of information with regards to where which country actually will need more uh, vaccines or not. And this, this tracker, um, made me reflect on if this was available before, because before COVID-19, we were in a, M a measles outbreak. We had the measles outbreak that nobody saw coming. We were, we were worrying about the decreasing of the vaccination coverage rates happening because of vaccine hesitancy, but nobody saw actually the outbreaks as that came in one go, spread across Europe in, in, in one go. And, and with regards to, to, to moving the, the supply of vaccines to ensure that the, the countries that was the most um, impacted by the outbreaks could actually benefit from, from, from the vaccines very quickly. I mean, this has been a significant exercise. And all of this could be better anticipated if when you see that your vaccination coverage rate is below what is recommended to avoid such an outbreak, um, then you can act and anticipate better. And this link to another potential uh, value of digitalization. Uh, so beyond the uh, immunization record system, here I'm going to talk about the digitalization of the packaging uh, of, of the vaccines. And we have the ability, because vaccines are very specific, once more, because they are not self uh, administered. They are administered by the healthcare providers. And here, I mean, I don't know if you had uh, uh, access to the box of your vaccines, your COVID-19 vaccines recently or not at all, or any vaccines that you've been vaccinated with, but it's really rare, in fact, that you have access to the box and the packaging of your, of your vaccines, meaning that the, the um, paper format that there is in the pack to inform about uh, everything about the indication of, of the vaccines, the, the patients or the citizens really do not have access to it. And here, uh, this is a component of the packaging that is creating complexity for the vaccines manufacturer uh, because it has to be adapted in the local language where the vaccine is actually uh, administered. And if you want to move your pack around the region because you have an outbreak, because one country needs more vaccines and did not anticipate them, and one did not have some stock that is not going to be used, you can move your stock around uh, in order to face uh, any emergency. But this packaging that needs to be sent back to the manufacturer to be repackaged, to be sent to another country takes weeks takes weeks to, to uh, and, and, and potentially months in order to be uh, repackaged in the right language. And, and transforming the, the patient leaf, paper patient leaflet into an electronic format where um, uh, everybody have access to the information but in an electronic way would significantly reduce uh, the, uh, this, um, uh, this manufacturing process and really uh, speed up our ability to, uh, to, to, to send the vaccines when, where it is needed and to ensure that we, uh, we provide the protection as quick as possible. And, and this, is, um, this is really a, a, an important one with regards to uh, the efficiency of the uh, supply chain. And this links to timely monitoring as well. So uh, all of this is connected together and we can 
work better also uh, from our side if um, if we uh, have this digi digitalization of the of the systems so in a, in a, in to summary is uh, is important that we work in a pan, in a harmonization at a pan european level with regards to uh, to, uh, to 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 the systems and also um, the european health data space uh, for us is really important and must reflect the specificities of the vaccination data because um, so that the, the, the data the collection and and uh, the sharing and use of such data will definitely uh, allow us at European level to uh, to improve public health uh, across the 27 member states and this today is critical because we knew it before but I think the COVID-19 really demonstrated that viruses have no borders so having an immunization policy at one place that is not coordinated or integrated and, and do not actually uh, correspond to another place is not working, is not safe. Um, having electronic immunization records, for instance, or an electronic immunization cards is not something new. Uh, with regards to policies, this is this was already targeted back to 2018 in the uh, Council recommendation of the EU uh, as an outcome already of a, of a public health crisis uh, that we had because of infectious diseases. So an evolution from H1N1 uh, back to 2009. Uh, to, to some shortages that we had in vaccines uh, because of the, la the, the lack of anticipation of demand, plus the measles outbreaks that, uh, that we've been in for, for many years. So, so this is not new. This is not new. And here we really have the ground to, to make it happening uh, in a concrete manner. I pause Thank here. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sibylia, and thank you for uh, reminding us uh, of, um, of vaccination and, and immunization as a public health mission and, uh, and going through uh, the, uh, the central uh, role of, of uh, data and uh, how the, uh, the digital transformation will be a game changer uh, for um, uh, vaccination and vaccination development. Before I ask you a question, I would just like to remind our audience uh, to use the question and answer um, functionality. Uh, you can find it at the bottom of the screen. And uh, please uh, drop your questions at any time uh, to our speakers, and we will uh, pick them up uh, after actually Daphne's uh, presentation. But first, uh, Sibylia, could you, um, could you just um, elaborate on, um, on a few examples uh, of collaborating with other stakeholders, you as manufacturer, as, as industry, uh, in order to maximize the, the value of data for uh, vaccine development and, uh, and distribution. So how do, you uh, how do you collaborate with others, with other stakeholders? So we have been involved in several public-private partnership initiatives, notably in the context of IMI. Um, so there has been uh, one, well, se several in fact, but one that I can mention was the uh, ad advanced uh, public-private partnership under IMI, which really aim at uh, creating a, 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 a new EU system uh, to collect data on brand-specific vaccine effectiveness. So, so you you know exactly uh, you follow product effectiveness. It's not mixed. Uh, uh, just for influenza, for example. So it was developed for influenza as a consequence of uh, H1N1 because we need to have good data on effectiveness and on safety. Uh, and, and, and it has to be product specific because the vaccines vary. So we need to know which vaccines work the best for whom, yeah. et cetera. So this, uh, this advanced uh, initiative, uh, which translated into DRIVE, which was food specific, has been uh, leveraged in the context of COVID-19, for instance, and we had this COVID DRIVE uh, partnership initiative that was uh, that was done, and 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 this was very uh, very important because we could really uh, look at the effectiveness of those vaccines in a timely manner and really adapt um, the, the the recommendation accordingly. Effectiveness is a requirement that um, so so we collect those data once they are on the market. So it's post marketing uh, data, and this is a requirement that the industry needs to fulfill for the regulatory agencies for EMA. So this is a requirement, but doing this alone, I mean, it, it is not 
the purpose. We need to collaborate with the others. And the IMI initiative for advance with Drive and COVID Drive was really a, a, an opportunity for every stakeholders in this field to work together. Thank you, uh, thank you, Sevilla. And uh, before uh, we move uh, to the um, uh, civil society point of view, I'd just like to uh, draw attention to uh, the similarity between Bledin and, uh, and uh, you, uh, Sevilla, in terms of including data. So having an immunization uh, uh, data space within EHDS, this is Bledin, what Bledin was asking for. And, and uh, uh, the industry's point of view is taking into the specificities of immunization data, so including into HDS and with, it, uh, with their uh, specificities. Um, let's uh, uh, move to uh, our uh, final, uh, last uh, stakeholder view. Uh, last but not least of all, civil society and citizens' uh, point of view, uh, very important. Uh, welcome, uh, Daphne Holt. Uh, Daphne is chair of the Coalition of, uh, for Life Course Immunization. And uh, she has experience uh, in uh, medical research and education and uh, international charity management. Uh, Daphne, please uh, present to us what civil society uh, represents and what your views uh, are as citizens. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to join this discussion. It's really fascinating. Um, just a few words first about the uh, Coalition of Life Course Immunization. Um, we are a diverse expert network with members in around 15 countries. And we have ambitions for expansion to have at least one member in all EU countries, but also in the long term, all countries in the WHO European region. Um, and we are committed to the prevention of infectious diseases across the life course. Now, Sibelia has already mentioned life course immunization. Um, and to do that, we have to shift the paradigm from vaccines are just for children to vaccines are for everyone. So at all ages and stages of life. So um, adolescents, pregnant women, uh, chronic disease sufferers, uh, working age adults and, and older adults. Um, and if you think about all of those uh, groups, um, I've got just one major point to make. Um, about uh, the European health data space, and that is around communications. How will this, these data collection systems um, and the need for them be communicated to the public? Um, and when I say the public, I mean all of those groups that I just mentioned, as well as healthcare professionals. Um, and actually, my comments are very brief. All of us around this table and many listening know the understanding, know and understand that data collection is paramount. And we all understand the importance of having data driven decision making. But how are we going to com communicate that? I read yesterday a Q&A document issued by the European Commission on the 3rd of May 2022, which actually was not terribly helpful, it has to be said. Um, and it was not until it was well down the, the document in the what's in it for me section that it stated the data can only be accessed and processed in closed, secure environments and only anonymized data can be downloaded. Now, Thomas Laff mentioned this when he was speaking about um, primary um, uh, access and input and, and the secondary use uh, of data. Um, and people, I think, are very wary of what data is being collected and shared about them and to whom. And it's important, therefore, that there is transparency about how the data is co collected, analysed and used. And it's paramount as these data collection systems are developed and are in general use that a clear communications plan is developed alongside which will bring the public and healthcare professionals along with it. And Bledin made the point about listening to, as well as importing information. So what do people think about this? What do they want to know about it? And then providing the information in a, uh, a way that's, that's um, easily assimil assimilated and for the different um, areas of people that we want to speak to, uh, the different populations that we want to speak to, we, how do we get the messages across? Who gives the messages? This is uh, another thing. 
because it's already been said, um, and I'll reinforce that, these systems are exactly what we needed to make healthcare more efficient. And as more people travel across borders, as workers, as migrants, and as refugees, um, we need to have that, uh, we need to have this information easily available. But it all relies on the trust and confidence of the public to want to input their data um, in the first instance. Some will be wary, as I've said, some will not have the technical ability. And I think we really have to remember this. Not everybody um, has their computer in front of them, um, wants to have a computer in front of them, wants to be able to do this. Some will be completely apathetic. Um, that, that's, that's probably a majority of the population when it comes down to it. They rely on their healthcare professionals to, to do this. And some will be outright hostile. And we have to think about that as well. So I ask that um, as these systems are developed and civil society has a real uh, um, part to play here, that there is clear a clear communication strategy that's developed alongside um, so that it can be effectively promoted to patients, healthcare professionals, and to all of us, actually. And I say alongside, let's this not be an after effect, an, an afterthought that's just tacked on. We have to do it um, each step of the way. As I said, I would be brief. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne, indeed. Indeed, uh, it has been uh, brief, but uh, but punchy. The, the main messages uh, have been uh, uh, conveyed, uh, I, I believe. And uh, indeed, I, I also uh, noticed right at the beginning uh, the life course uh, perspective uh, that both you and Sevilla uh, advocated uh, for. And thank you very much, Daphne, also for reminding us that uh, civil society, it's everyone. So everyone is a citizen at the end of the day, uh, regardless of the other roles, uh, professional roles that you uh, play in society, like healthcare professionals as well, but they are also part of uh, civil society. Um, and uh, you mentioned uh, transparency and and uh, hesitancy uh, trust uh, in um, in uh, in vaccines. So, uh, how do you think that data and digitalization can be vehicles for restoring trust in in vaccination in the in in the population? You mentioned uh, indeed a very powerful tool, communication. Uh, but what what else? How do you see restoring trust by using data? Uh, this is the $64,000 question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> trust uh, has uh, has almost slid away um, over the past few years, I believe. Um, and it's once the trust has gone, it's really difficult to restore it. I think this needs um, a great deal of work on everybody's part. And I think it really needs, um, it's a pity actually, Thomas Love is not, is not um, here to, 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 to perhaps join in, because I think that also applies to politicians um, and to our political structure, uh, as well as to, to um, all the rest of us. Um, and I think this, I think transparency is really important um, that we do actually make it clear how decisions are made. Um, and we've already spoken about this word empowerment. Um, and uh, it's important that people know they are empowered to, to, to understand, to, to, to um, uh, speak about what they, that they feel um, and that it's listened to. And um, yeah, as Thomas Lass said, not every, uh, not every opinion can be taken into account because they are often contradictory. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that they shouldn't be heard. This is, I think this is the point. Um, and that um, policy and politics is, is often really important in this. Um, and restoring trust, okay, it has to be done. Um, but I think this will only come by, by um, gentle movement, shall we say. You can't enforce trust on people and it's our own actions um, those of us that are in this, this space, as it were, it's our own actions that help to rebuild that. 
Thank you very much. And uh, we are perfectly on time. We fi uh, finished uh, uh, listening to uh, all uh, stakeholder views. So uh, we have a question which I believe is uh, actually to all of our speakers. And uh, please, uh, Zach, uh, come to back to us if you, if you wish to uh, comment on this as well. Um, uh, how could, so uh, um, unfortunately not all uh, uh, populations uh, and, and the population groups have uh, equal access uh, to, to vaccination. Um, so how could uh, digital transformation and the data sharing improve uh, equity in uh, in uh, vaccination rates across Europe. I think it's uh, it's relevant to all our uh, speakers. So who would like to start? Ah, Zach. Yes. I'm happy to get the ball rolling on this one because uh, I did Please mention this uh, as well in my presentation, I know, and it's actually come up in the work that we're doing um, on the European level with the HEDEA project on overcoming obstacles to vaccines. And I think a key here is the ability to share best practices and share the data. So the idea that I briefly touched on saying, you know, health managers at the local level sometimes don't have the information they need to know how to reach some of these hard to reach populations, how to improve the equity of, of access to vaccines within their communities and within their regions. But maybe someone in another region and another country has a very excellent program uh, for reaching exactly this population and can overcome a lot of the challenges that, that is, are being faced. Uh, and I think by having this open network and the ability to share some of these practices and, and what works and what doesn't work across countries, across borders, across regions, we really will start to build a bit of a um, expertise uh, community across Europe uh, where we can share and where we can reach these populations easier because we know what's being done and we know what works. Okay, thank you, Zachary. So one way would be uh, sharing good practices. Would uh, anyone else? Yes, Celia. What would be your recipe to addressing uh, inequities? I think that there are two things. There's data and there is system. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so there is a system that can inform and it can inform the healthcare professionals that when there is an at-risk patient, then there is a dedicated um, vaccine. And, and that system is not complicated <laughs> uh, to, 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 to have. And uh, because often there is a, an issue with the healthcare providers, they, do, they are not up to date or they are, don't have the right, they didn't receive the right trainings. And, and mainly in the at risk population for, uh, for, for people with chronic diseases, this is the most difficult to, uh, to, to reach and, uh, and to get the, at the right level of vaccination. And, uh, and, and this system can help, actually, can really be a, 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 a net tool for healthcare professionals uh, to identify the patients that are at high risk and to give them access to vaccines, whether it is rural or urban, by the way. Huh? So beyond just general practitioners, it can be diabetologists, it can be uh, uh, any uh, a, a specialist that could have this information. And then there is data. So that's the systems helping for decision making pro, uh, process at uh, really the, uh, uh, the point of clinical care. And then there is data. When you have data, you cannot hide anymore. When you know that at a specific risk uh, group of a population, you don't reach the coverage rates, you know that you need to do something. So, so this is also uh, while timely monitoring of the vaccination coverage rate for every eligible population is critical, whether it is a healthy one, whether it is the at-risk ones, because once you know where you are at with your coverage rates, you know whether you are where you should be or not. And if you're not, then you need to implement straight away the right communication campaign, the right information um, uh, system for, for your healthcare providers to Take, to take care of this, of this and to ensure that the coverage rates uh, are achieved and the population is protected. So, uh, so for me, there is two things here, the systems and the data. Okay, thanks very much. So uh, good practices, system, data. Vladin? Yeah, just building on, and actually what I think uh, Sibelia was saying, I like, I like that analysis of uh, data and system uh, and uh, what Zach was saying. So, one of the things that the data is going to give you from the system is uh, what good programs look like. 
So uh, the ability to better design campaigns, learn from other campaigns, people who have done it well and who have reached, let's say, hard to reach groups, whatever it may be. And then I think another another example is where uh, the data uh, allows the better management of the supply chain. So uh, need against uh, availability of vaccines. And I think that, you know, one of the things that was almost bordering on criminal uh, in the pandemic was how some countries got vaccines, other countries didn't. Uh, and clearly, um, if you if you've got a better grip on who's got the bigger need, who, where where are the vaccines, you can better target and have more equitable access to uh, to vaccines. So I so I think that uh, we're just touching uh, some individual ideas, but actually that whole idea of data and systems combined and what they can deliver is a, is a has a big part to play in uh, providing uh, more equal access. Yes, thanks very much. Uh, Daphne, would you like to also add something for this round? Yes, and I'm going to go back to, to the communications, data systems communications, yeah. um, because uh, access um, access now with, with uh, pharmacies um, being on board, um, but we, we are talking about a population where we have a large population of, of healthy adults. Um, that we want to be vaccinated and those healthy adults don't go to their doctors very often the word is in it's there yeah. isn't it the word healthy um, so we have to find some way of um, uh, equalizing the communication or making the communication equitable so that we we do get this this um th this idea across the vaccines are for everyone it, it's 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 that is fundamental and so data systems communication yeah and good practices <laughs> and good practices <laughs> yes <laughs> absolutely and, and good uh, practices you see they're good practices in communications as well indeed as indeed the other you, you you yeah. you communicate yes yes yeah, yeah. i was also thinking of that uh i would risk another question if you agree but we would need a very um uh short um uh, round of answers to that open communication open dialogue between uh, stakeholders. So how could we better promote open uh, dialogue um, in order to uh, support uh, the digital transformation uh, and meeting that, that goal that we mentioned at the beginning? Of course, a webinar like this is a, is a good example because we had uh, policymakers, we had civil society, we had industry, uh, we had a multi-stakeholder view already represented, but what else? could we do um can i add yes a, yes a contentious on. idea here but um and this this may be a silly remark really but we have open communication we have something called um social media yeah. um and the communication the communication there um it's we need the, the the positive messages to be as strong and as well communicated as the the um, less positive messages, shall mm. we say? Yeah, yeah. So focus on focus on positive. Mm. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, Bledin and uh, then Sibilia. So I so I think a, a couple of quick suggestions. One, we need greater collaboration between NGOs, and today is a great example where. Uh, different organizations have been involved in different pieces of work around vaccination, but we need to do more together because the answer here does not lie with one stakeholder. It lies with all stakeholders working together here to drive solutions. Secondly, we need to understand that trust is actually very complicated mm -hmm. and there's lots of work being done by different organizations. But one of the things I, I just want to emphasize here is it, it's partly cultural. So the trust that Nordic countries have with their governments is not mirrored in Mediterranean countries. <laughs> and we need to we need to be able to actually tailor the communications in an intelligent way. And I think we need the, the commission at times when it when it when it consults thinks that a good result is when it has a few hundred responses yes. or a thousand responses. The EHDS is so important to tens of millions of citizens that we need much larger scale 
consultations that deal with the trust issues if we're to truly learn and understand the challenges that our citizens uh, uh, that concern them and to be able to address them. And then I could not agree more with Daphne's comment about what we need to communicate are the benefits because that's what people, if, if people truly understood what some of the benefits were, then the downsides which are which are prevail on, on social media would, would be placed into much better context and people could make much better informed decisions. Thank you very much. Very quickly, Sibiria. Um, yeah, um, so quickly, uh, going back to public-private collaboration, I think this is, uh, tremendously important. Uh, I mean, no silos in infectious diseases in the same way there is uh, no uh, no border. Fin, viruses have no borders. We should not have any borders with regards to flow of information, dialogue, sharing, knowledge. It's a very specific area. The know-how is really important, and we all have different know-how to bring, whether it is from the industry, whether it is from the public health, whether it is from the civil society, whether it is from the from the uh, the governments with regards to to, to the programs, and, and there should not be silos and there is silos today there are silos uh, and and we need to go over that and to go back to what has been said and and, and i think it's you daphne who mentioned it is about transparency mm -hmm. we can work and have an open collaboration public and private in full transparency it has to be put in place it is happening elsewhere but we have to say that in europe is particularly complex so we need to work on this i mean it's part of the democratic process at the end of the day uh, it works elsewhere uh, so there is no reason why you would not work in within europe i mean we can work for example and collaborate with WHO or with the cdc uh, in the us things are much more complex and and this is impacting trust because if you start creating silos that means that some people do not work uh, some organization do not want to work with others then you create suspicions of why is that so the lack of transparency, the lack of uh, um, collaboration between certain stakeholders in that complex vaccine ecosystem drives vaccine hesitancy as well. So we need uh, this uh, solution here uh, to, to unlock uh, and to ensure an open dialogue among all the relevant stakeholders that are part of this vaccine ecosystem to ensure vaccines confidence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the meantime, I posted uh, a link, uh, which is a WHO uh, has alert um, that um, uh, brings um, uh, billions uh, of uh, COVID-19 facts uh, on, on, uh, on the WhatsApp. Um, and uh, now I, I just have uh, one minute to, um, to uh, wrap up. Um, vaccina vaccination, uh, vaccination and immunization is complex. It's a public health mission, as Lilia said. Uh, we have to focus on life course perspective and uh, approach, as we heard. Uh, digital transformation is a game changer uh, in terms of efficiency, resilience, and, uh, and creating, uh, restoring uh, confidence. Data is key uh, to unlock the existing um, uh, bottlenecks. That bottlenecks. Um, you all refer, referred to EHDS, European Health Data Space, which is a unique opportunity. Uh, and uh, even within EHDS, you proposed uh, to uh, you um, uh, an immunization data space, uh, taking into uh, account the specific specificities of uh, vaccine uh, data. Uh, and um, uh, also, as uh, Ibilia mentioned, the, the follow-up to the Czech Presidency Council in terms of uh, uh, EHDS um, uh, and, and vaccination data, um, and by, uh, taking uh, into account wide stakeholder views is key, as we saw uh, now, um, uh, focus on uh, 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 immunization uh, information systems and uh, uh, committing the uh, EU presidency countries, uh, national commitment or, or member state uh, commitment would be uh, key, key. And then coming to the end, 
communication, clear, consistent communication for promotion, uh, uh, highlighting positive messages and uh, transparency. So these would be uh, my, my final words. And I think that my uh, uh, colleagues would like me to promote the EMA 23 conference uh, taking place in uh, in Rome on the 5th and 7th of June. And uh, I'm uh, also just asking uh, all of you, if you have uh, ideas, um, uh, I uh, submit your abstract by the 6th of February. And I would like to uh, thank uh, all our uh, speakers that uh, led in. Uh, Tomislav, who unfortunately had to leave us, Sibelia and uh, Daphne for this excellent uh, webinar. And uh, I would also like to um, uh, thank my colleagues, Anna and Domenico, who in the background uh, made this mo the smooth uh, management of this webinar possible. Thank you very much and see you next time. Of course, the recordings uh, and the follow-up materials will be available on the EMMA website. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Thank, thank you all.